Okay. Thank you, Randy. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our dressage instructors webinar. We have uh, already met Randy. Hi, Randy. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. How are you doing today, Laura? I'm great. Thank you, Randy. And we also have Jody Lees. How are you doing, Jody? I'm doing great. Very happy to be here. Looking forward to tonight. Me too, and my name is Laura Kelland May, and I'm just going to be traffic controller and moderator this evening to get things and keep things on track, and I want to thank you all for being here, and we kind of did a little bit of uh, where everybody's from, and I'm so excited to see the different places people are from. So I want to go go over the schedule for this evening, so we have lots of good information. I want you to put down your phone, turn it off. We don't want anybody ringing their phones. Uh, that goes for all of us here in the panel too. And close down the other browser pages on your, your browser just because it takes up the bandwidth and then we get fuzzy and I don't like being fuzzy. So turn off the other distractions and get a pen and paper handy to take notes. And if you want to see the replay, there's going to be a replay when it becomes available. All right, so we have three topics this evening, just like we do every other one that we've done of these. Uh, first topic is from the judges box, and this is where we discuss simple tips and techniques so that you can improve your dressage scores. Topic number two is teaching techniques, uh, and we're going to discuss a little bit about communicating with your students. And topic three is Horse Business 101, and we focus this segment on record keeping. And then at the end of this time, I'm going to go over some of the, the new topics, some of the updates for the live event in the spring in the Tryon, North Carolina area. That's good. All right. Massage Instructors you... Boot Camp. The Dressage Instructors Boot Camp, right on. And speaking of Dressage Instructors, if you are on Facebook, please go to the Dressage Instructors Facebook page. We'd love to see you there. There's lots of tips, lots of links, lots of helpful information that you can get, that you can use right now to help you and your students transform your riding right now. Okay, I'm going to go right into the first topic. Are you ready, Randy? You ready, Jody? Absolutely. Excellent. Okay, last webinar we discussed accuracy and geometry for the dressage test. Now, that webinar is going to be is available on the dressage instructor's Facebook page if you want to see that, if you missed it. Now, Jody, how do we build on this geometry? Where do we go from here? So, yes, as you mentioned, the last webinar, we, we posed the question, how can we help our students um, as instructors um, get better dressage scores? And basically, as a judge, I said one of the things that we can um, improve is the accuracy in our tests. And last webinar, we talked about riding uh, circles with correct geometry and really improving the accuracy of those circles. And one of the other areas that we can certainly um, help our students improve is riding straight lines better. Um, now, I want to mention last time that we that we did talk about three resources that we have, and I just want to remind you that the test sheet itself is a great tool for you to use with your students. It's got purpose and directives on it for each movement. The USEF, which is now called US Equestrian um, Rule Book, is a phenomenal treasure of information, the dressage section, and reminding you that you need to get your students um, riding in those regulation dressage courts so that they're familiar with the, the dimensions of the court and therefore can ride more accurately. Um, so straight lines in a test, where do we see them? Obviously the center line on in the beginning and the end of the test, and that's the first impression that your rider makes on the judge. Um, we see straight lines, our diagonal lines are straight lines. Um, there are also straight lines when we turn across the arena, let's say from E to B. And then what's not really used in the test very often, but is a super training tool, is your quarter lines. Those are great for training and working with your students um, to help them understand what that straightness is. Um, 
So the three ways that we can really improve our straight lines, that is to really teach our students how to ride from point to point. We're going to go through some exercises on each of these. All of us have something to contribute. Um, and then really ride in correct corners before and after those straight lines. Um, and then understanding and teaching your, your students how to understand shoulder fork positioning, which is a straightening um, position. So those are the three ways that we can improve the straight lines. Um, so as I mentioned, that center line, it's the first impression that your rider makes, and it's the last impression that they leave on the judge. Um, what we see as judges is we see over the center line gets overshot, we see at C, when let's say you're tracking to the left, riders will swerve way out to the right, or they'll completely cut the turn and not even get to C. Um, and so therefore, that's affected that straight line. And then, of course, it's going to affect the next diagonal line that comes out of that corner. Um, now, I have a little tip that was given to me from Leslie Webb years ago. Um, in some of her tapes, she said you have to develop a language with your horse. And that's one of our, our jobs as instructors is to help our students develop that language with their horse. And I always tell my students, it's a very simple, easy test, um, tip. As you're approaching C, if you're going to track to the left, your, or that's, it, your inside leg should go forward to the girth, your outside hand should lower. That controls the outside shoulder, and it supports the inside shoulder from falling in. And the horse knows exactly which direction they're going to turn in, especially if this is practiced over and over. So that's a little lang you know, that's a little tip that um, you can use on the actual center line itself. Yes. Randy, I know you have yes. some some yes. tips for riding straightness and and turns and helping people direct the horses. I think it's important what you said about using the outside leg as a cue for our students that we're teaching because our goal is to give them tools that they can use that will make a difference in what they're trying to do. So we were talking about different ways that we can get horses straight and as we were discussing it we realized you know straightness has to come before we can actually straighten a horse and that reminded me of back in the beginning when I first started learning the dressage word, which back then we used to call dressage because it was still very new in the United States. And one of the things that I learned was to be able to have a rider ride to a point, like Jody was saying, point to point. So what you would do as an instructor is set up either a cone or have them look at a, at a fence post or a tree and have them ride their horse straight at that object. Now, it's not as easy as it sounds because first they have to make sure the horse is straight and that their riding position is straight. So what we do as riding instructors is try to break it down into a simple step-by-step -step process that we can teach to our riders. So the first thing we can teach our riders is if they're going to straight, do a straight line with their horse, they have to look where they're going. Next, their riding position has to be positioned in that straight line, which can be as simple as point your belly button in the direction or towards the object that you want to go to. Now, something else that I found that's really interesting because I focus on teaching a lot of riding instructors is if we tell our riders to point the center of their saddle, the pommel, in the direction they want, such as in a straight line, it should point straight up the mane so it's straight with the horse's neck and that way you know your horse is straight. So this is a process that you can use to start teaching your riders how to ride a straight line, and they're going to be wobbling all over at first. Now you'll be able to see it because we're talking about positioning by standing either in front of the rider and telling them what's going on, or behind the rider. And again, we're always asking our riders, what are you feeling, how are you feeling, and what are you doing with that process? What are the processes do you have, Jody? Well, I want to add to what you say because, it, like I said with that language with the horse, the, the, not only does the rider have to understand what's going to happen, but the horse has to understand where they're going and what, where, um, what's expected of them. So, um, it, you know, I, I think all of the points that you made were really super. I want to bring up that quite often turning onto the center line or onto a diagonal line, um, people wait, riders wait and turn at the line. 
So I, I really encourage you as instructors to teach them how to learn to turn on to that line. The lines are written from letter to letter, and quite often what we see is that people pass the letter, so they swerve out. Now they pass the diagonal line and they overcompensate and swerve the other way to get back to um, the letter. So it, it's a complete loss of a straight line. When you're writing a diagonal line, the time to have your students turn onto that diagonal line is when that horse's shoulder is just approaching the letter. At that point, those shoulders will turn onto that diagonal line. They'll go all the way across until those shoulders reach that far letter, and then they will turn onto the long side and into the corner. So that's another way of being able to help your students with some visualization and some practicing um, that they can control those shoulders and make that turn onto the line. Um, and and the third one of the other things that I mentioned was that of course there's always a corner before and after a straight line in a test, almost always. And if the riders are just falling through the corners, they're not ever going to be able to set themselves up for that next movement properly, that next straight line. It's important that they learn, even at training and first level, how to ride a corner. It may not be as deep and as collected and as balanced as a Grand Prix rider, but there's still a level of balance. And the corner should look different than a 20-meter circle line going you know, through that, that short side. So... It, they do have to differentiate and produce a corner. One of the exercises that I use for helping my riders at all levels really practice riding corners well. For instance, if I have a rider that you know can trot to that corner before the corner, halt, walk through the corner, trot out. I mean, on the, after the corner, trot on that short side. Before the corner, halt walk through the corner, trot down the long side, and do that until they feel like they have control of that exercise. When they do, they can then trot, walk without the halt, trot. When they have control of that, they can trot, slowly trot through the corner, trot out of the corner with more into forward intention. And so you can see how as you practice that, they would start to gain control of the balance of the corners. And with advanced students, you can do it with canter, halt, walk, canter. So in, with a very beginner student, you can do walk, halt, walk, halt. I mean, so it's a way to really give riders an opportunity to feel what does it feel like to turn your horse through that corner. Now, Randy, I know that you have, um, you know, some exercises on and some comments on how you actually might help the riders make that turn. Well, it's the same concept as you were saying. And, and instructors, all of you who are watching this, you'll notice that we've been doing this for a while, so we've always used step-by-step -step processes because that way we always know where we need to go to start over again if we need to, which, as we all know, happens a lot in our training process. So I would go back to the same concept of, well, to get a rider to learn to ride straight, first they need to become aware of their riding position and where the horse is. So when it comes to going from a corner, a straight line into a curve or a corner, first the rider has to look, then the horse has to look, and then the rider uses their riding position to position the horse for the curve, which as we know is basically the preparation for a shoulder four. Now when you're doing the curve and you're positioning the horse, all you have to do, and you've got to try this at home, ask your riders to point the front of their saddle in the direction they want to go, and you'll find that it automatically makes them, without you having to tell them so much, use the right aids to be able to bring the horse's shoulder in the right direction. So that's a technique that I use is pointing the belly button, looking where the rider's going, making sure the front of the saddle and the horse's chest are pointed in the direction that you want them to go. Really good point, Sir Randy, and I uh, really like it. It's a really good. I think what I just want to want to bring up again is we're corner after the straight line and before the straight line and the preparation of that corner is what helps you gain control of that straight line and there are often misconceptions about the corners that um, people want to overbend their horses in the corner which yeah. actually causes that outside horses outside shoulder to kind of ricochet off the 
the new long side, and now they're really in trouble um, after the corner, and the horse is completely unbalanced. Because um, have- and often approach the corners too fast, yes. and then they can't gain control of the horses through the corner. So that one exercise, the exercises we talk about will help riders gain control, and the shoulder four positioning, controlling the outside shoulder and the inside hind leg to create alignment will really help the health. And it's a, it's a whole big topic, shoulder four, but I want to start by just saying one of the things I do with my students is I put then I ask them to, to stop on the long side and line themselves up with the rail of the arena. And almost always, unless they've been introduced to it, they will put their horse's outside shoulder on the rail and the horse's outside hindquarters on the rail. Now, we all know, but we may not be thinking about it, the horse's hindquarters are wider than the horse's um, shoulders. So when they're on that long side, this being the rail, and they put shoulder and haunches like this, they end up with it, the haunches are in like this because the haunches are wider. Shoulder four positioning would take those shoulders and create straightness like this. So it takes the shoulders a little bit off of the track and aligns them with the hind legs. Now, some of us like to see that from the front, some of us like to see it from the back as far as instructors, um, but you as an instructor have to know what to look for. Um, when you look at a horse from the back as an instructor and you want to say to that rider, this is or is not shoulder four positioning, what are you looking for? What should an instructor see when That's they great, are um, looking for shoulder four positioning? That's a great question because a lot of instructors aren't sure and they just, you know, how many instructors we know that stick in the center of the ring and they don't move? You know, and I know as part of the USDF instructors programs, they always taught us to get outside of the ring. You know, go stand outside of the ring and see things. But, you know, we've been around a while and I'll get behind a rider and what I'm looking for are in front and what I'm looking for is on a curve or a straight line in the dressage court, the inside front leg and the inside back leg, the footprint should track up in the same track like a train track. When they're going around a curve, we might want to bring the shoulder over just a little bit more, not a lot, but that's where you can see as an instructor, get behind or in front of your students and just look. Is the horse tracking up on the inside legs, the footprints? If they are, the horse is straight, the rider is probably going to feel like the horse is crooked. But that's where you make a difference as an instructor, when they're out of balance. And from the judge's point of view, from the, from the judge's point, it, it's amazing how you can sit at C or in any of the other positions, but at C. And going down, you can see a rider go down that long side, and they quite often have no idea that their horse's haunches are way inside the arena. Because what they're doing is riding down that long side with that shoulder on the rail. And if that shoulder's on the rail, those haunches have to be in. And that's what we have to really teach them at, even at an, you know, as soon as they're able to start to comprehend this, we need to start bringing it to their attention. So they recognize that, you know, our concept as a two-legged beast is not of straightness, is not the same as a four-legged horse with wider hindquarters than shoulders. So it's really important to see that your rider from every angle and to really help your rider get a feel and an understanding for what shoulder four positioning is. And it's something that takes practice and time. And a lot of times the riders think, well, I'm in counterflexion or this feels like I'm bending my horse the wrong way. And they have to learn what the feel of straightness and alignment is because it's not, it just doesn't offer itself um, the way that, other things do. So it is a big nugget. Straightness is a really big nugget. But from the very beginning, you know, training level test, you have to come up that center line, you have to come twice, you have to go across the diagonal, you have to go down alongside. And all of those require, if you're going to ride accurately and get higher scores, they require alignment and, and straightness. And it's a guy's instructor so to, to teach them that. teaching our horses and our riders early. About All right, that. now Jody and Randy, I just want to uh, break in here. Exactly. I, I really like what you yep. said, Jody, when you said you, the riders 
uh, don't often know whether or not they're straight. And that kind of leads us into our second topic, which is the teaching techniques, and go into that a little bit more. So, Jody, how would you use some questioning techniques uh, to make your riders better riders? Well, I think that, um, you know, we call it the Socratic method, Socrates, who kind of came up with this teaching method using questions. Um, but really, the way I like to look at it is that if we ask questions of our riders, there are certain things that we gain. Number one, we gain information. We get to under know if they understand what they're feeling, and we get to ask them questions that give us under an understanding of what their knowledge is. And then um, what else do we gain? We start to empower our riders and teach them to be more thinking riders. Instead of just funnels getting information, they're starting now to play with that information and try to you know, think about how um, they are interacting with their horse. And we problem solve. Um, as a pair, a, a teacher and a student, we start to problem solve um, the issues that come up. So it's really important that we do ask questions of our students. Um, my favorites, I, I, you know, my favorites to ask are, um, how does that feel? Um, what do you like about this? What do you not like? And how, what can you do about it? All of those questions give us an opportunity to gain information and they give an opportunity for the student to kind of think. Well, what the questions that you like to use most? The massage instructors webinar, we're thinking writers. We like to create thinking writers. And to be able to do that, it all comes down to communication. Now, it wasn't long ago that instructors, trainers, coaches, their idea of communication in the horse world was the military style. So they pretty much told us what to say or do. And we didn't say anything. You know, we just did whatever they told us, but times have changed, you know, and a lot of it is the women that have been in, getting involved in the horse industry who are teaching people new ways to communicate. So this, the method of questioning is something that now has become very popular, not only for, you know, business reasons, because we have to have, be able to have a step-by-step -step process, but also as a way to determine exactly where our riders are. So, for example, for a lower level rider. Let's start with the beginning level riders that you might be coaching. How can you determine if they are in fact safe when they're riding? What mm -hmm. questions would you ask to make sure that they're not losing their balance in the saddle? How do you know when they're losing their balance? Do you have an established system of communication with them? If not, you want to start thinking about it now, and the easiest way to do it is to learn to start asking questions. So first of all, with the beginner level riders, we want them to stay in the center of the saddle, of course, and we have to ask them questions. Are you feel, do you feel like you're losing your balance? Then we want to make sure they have control of the horse. So we have to every thing we do with them. Can you stop the horse? Can you start the horse? Can you steer the horse? And all the questions that you can incorporate with that. Of course, then we have our medium level riders. You know, what are you teaching your medium level riders? It could be a, something as easy as, well, what can a medium level rider do that a beginner level rider couldn't do? Well, they could control the horse's speeds. So what kind of questions can you ask them? Well, does it feel like your horse is taking you? are waiting for you. Now you'll notice I use questions that get the rider to actually start thinking about what they're learning. You know, and and they're feeling going, what they're learning too. Right? They're not just answering, they're feeling like, right. you know, is my horse taking me? What does that feel like? That's right. And we're going back into straightness. So with our medium level riders and our advanced level riders, what does straightness feel like? They exactly. don't know, so it's up to us. So first we have to demonstrate. And one of the ways, like we said, we can use the dressage court and use that, always questioning the rider. Does this feel straight? How does this feel different when the horse is crooked? We'll say, well, how does the horse feel now? Notice I'm using very pointed questions. For a more advanced rider, we might be going into, uh, you know, straightness. Is your horse connected? Uh, your horse is straight, but can you feel it lifting your seat? Is your horse leaning on the reins? What can you do to get the horse to stop leaning on the reins? And we all know it usually comes from the rider's legs. Right. You know, get the horse to step up so it connects and picks up the riders. So it all comes down to questions. Yeah. And one of the techniques that we discussed earlier was 
well, you know, we have to demonstrate to the riders what we want them to do, and then they need to demonstrate back to us that they are able to do it, and we determine what they learn by asking questions. But is by getting taking a hold of the front of the horse with any level of rider. You can do this with advanced riders, too. They might be a little embarrassed, but we get over it. Notice I said we. And you'll lead the horse in different directions. You could do figure eights. You can turn to the right or to the left. But first have the rider close their eyes and just lead them through the process. And what they're going to find is they're going to be sliding off the saddle when you turn to the left or to the right. Either, you know, they'll usually fall to the outside. So here your questioning comes in. Well, when I turn to the left, can you feel your, right, your seat sliding off the saddle? Well, that's great. Notice I'm affirming what they're saying. And then the next question would be, well, right. what do you have to do to adjust your position so it's in the center, you know, where you are in balance? And that's where I would have them open their eyes because for me it's easy. All they have to do is look at the center of the saddle, the pommel, you know, if they're riding English, the horn if they're riding Western. If it's in line with the horse's mane, the rider's balance is even on both sides at that moment in time. So to adjust their position, they shift the saddle over until they're in the middle. And what do I say? What do you feel now? When mm -hmm. they start slipping off, we'll be saying, well, can you feel when you start putting more weight, blah, 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 whatever the questions are. And that's how we can get people to start becoming thinking riders. What processes do you use to do that, Jody? Well, I want to make some, because you had so many great points there. And I mean, yeah. one, everything is an onion. We can just keep peeling. But... Of course, that exercise is excellent when um, you, then when you can start adding, well, how do you keep yourself from falling off? So now they start to learn how to use their muscles and their core and their thighs and their balance. So it's just a really super educational tool. And you know the other one of the other reasons I was just thinking why we want to ask questions is because often, and we all know this, if we get on our students' horses, we all know that it doesn't always look like it feels. We also know that from riding dressage tests. We can come out and it felt terrible, but we got a good score because it looked good. So one of the another reason that we would want to ask questions is to see, you know, are we matching? I think it looks good. Do you think it feels good? Because if I think it looks good and you don't think it feels good, now we need to have a discussion so that we get onto the same page. I think it, it, they're all super points. And I also think, you know, asking questions is excellent. And I think, you know, we do have to remember there's a time in our lessons where our students do need to just listen. We need to be able to teach. And then there's a time where we need to ask a question and we need to listen to them. Um, and then there's the time for the interaction. So that old style where we went into a lesson and we, you know, said yes sir, yes ma'am, and we just rode until they asked us a question or dismissed us at the end of the lesson, um, you know, is, 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 some people still do it, but I find that they, I think they're not really gaining, and their students aren't gaining what you can by interacting more effectively. Right, so, but they don't, they don't know until they know. I hear you saying something back there, Laura. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, sometimes you get the old uh, school yeah. instructors that's, that yeah. ask the yeah. hypothetical question like, what are you doing with your hands or why are you doing that? With just kind of no, what you mentioned, Randy, no positive affirmations at all to yes, that's good or no, that's not good. It was just kind of a rhetorical question of what the heck are you doing up there with no right. direction of of uh, for a correction or anything so I'm glad things have progressed <laughs> progressed oh, yeah. along from that way that's not a positive way to ask a question I agree with you Laura and that's really important because the the Socratic method is a positive method it's about bringing more education to life it's not about demeaning insulting or you know making someone feel in um, it, unable you know, so I don't learn well when people put me down or talk negative to me. So it shuts me down, and I know it does a lot of other. Let's talk about the wrap up of a lesson because a lot of people forget at the end of the lesson is probably the most important time where they can make sure what the writers understood. So when we finish a lesson, the last thing we should always do is take the time to ask questions again. 
you want to ask, what did you learn in today's lessons? Do you have a better feeling of straightness now? What are you going to do differently now with your horse to keep it straight when I'm not here? What you can do is we're going right back into the questioning to make sure that they understood what we were showing them because we have to demonstrate and then they have to demonstrate back that they've learned what we've been working at teaching them. Yes, because I think I try to always end my lessons with what can you take away from this lesson? Something simple. One or two things that you can take away from this lesson. What would that be? And it helps the rider clarify what happened in the lesson and it helps them instead of going away. I don't know. I've, I've written a million lessons in my life where I was so clear and then I came back and got on my horse the next day and I thought, how did I get there? And I think, you know, if we can help our riders, you know, take one or two things away by asking that question, then they're able to come out the next day and apply some piece of that lesson effectively. And on that note of asking questions, I try to, at the beginning of each lesson, say, what did we work on last lesson so that we can, um, so that we can grow and develop from previous rides as well. So wrapping up at the end of your lesson, but also at the beginning of your lesson, even starting that communication right off the bat with your students so that you are on the same page. Well, what did we learn last time? Oh, yes, I remember, blah, 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 that, you know, that type of thing. So you can open the door right then, and they're more willing to discuss things with you as well, right? Yes, and it does take practice. Like at first, I'm some of you, I know, Great point. it's the first time that you've heard anybody say this, and you're going, oh, man, not only do I have to do that, but I have to do this and do that. Just take your time. It'll change the way you communicate to everybody in your life. I know it did for mine. It was such an aha moment to realize if I want people to talk to me, all I have to do is ask them questions. So take your time. Maybe at first all you can do is ask a simple question. What do you feel? Try to make it more direct. What do you feel when your horse is doing this? Try to make it even more direct. Well, what can you do to rebalance or make it a better, you know, where you can go deeper? What other questions would you add there, Jody? It's got a bit of a lag. All right. We'll just wait for you. I'm here. There you go. Oh, did you ask me a question? I didn't quite hear you. Oh, that's all right. Well, well what I was saying is basically. I could hear you, but I didn't When did you question. learn to start questioning in your lesson process for coaching? I've been using it for a while. I, I don't, it's a little bit my personality, and I've been using it for a while, I think. So I can't quite tell you exactly when, but I knew every day I realized what a valuable tool it is. Um, and like you said, it's just uh, taking your time to listen and... And like, I really, I think I really just want my riders to be able to think. In fact, that's when it was. I think I realized I was sending riders and then I might not see them for a week and I would come back and they would feel lost. And then I realized how much that, how much I gained from asking those questions too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a great way for us to, to, to determine where they're really at because what do they say, like 80% of people will, you know, the telephone game where you say something and by the time oh. it gets to people, it's a whole different thing. Right. Well, and I think, you know, you want your riders to be able to go into their dressage test and think, you know, yeah. you can't be talking to them while they're in that dressage test. And you want them to be, when they're home riding without you, that they can think. And if you are only just spewing information and you're not ever asking them to evaluate it mentally, um, then they end up being a little lost on their own. So for me, I think that's, you know, that's a place that can be really powerful and really help create more depth in your relationship with your student. What about you, Laura? When did you start learning how to question your well, own? Well, I think uh, I was pretty lucky. One of my instructors, she, she would say, what are you doing right now to make that horse do that? or what is happening with your horse right now and why is it doing that? So I've brought that together with my coaching and uh, teaching right from the get-go. So if you, even with the beginner kids, beginner, I shouldn't say kids, but beginner riders, uh, you got your horse to move forward. Well, what did you do? Well, I lean forward or I kick with my legs or something basic, right up to the advanced students. 
What did you do to get your horse to do that? Because, and we've talked about this before, yeah. uh, Jody and Randy, is that you are always riding and training your horse. You are always teaching it something. And it may, they've never read the book that inside leg should be on the girth and outside leg should be behind the girth and inside rein. They, they haven't read that book. So we can train them. Uh, on us and we have to understand what our body is doing and how it's influencing the horse and the only way we know that as instructors is by asking our students what are you doing maybe it's you know when you're riding a thoroughbred maybe it's blinking your left eye twice and that's enough to get it to do something but you know so you have to kind of open that door when you get to it okay <laughs> And before, and I'd like to welcome yes. Ed, everybody who's here. If you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat box. It's just on the side. I'm not sure which side it's on. It's on one of those sides there. And ask your question there. We'll get to the questions if we have time at the end. And if we don't have time, then we will go to the dressage instructors page on Facebook and answer those questions for you there. But we'd like to have you, if you have any questions about what we talked about, please put it in the chat box. And if you're, if you are Twitter, using Twitter, please use the hashtag dressage instructors. We'd love to see you up there as well. And uh, what else do I have here to make notes? If you're just tuning in and just joining us now, we have uh, Randy Thompson, hi Randy, and Jody, hi Jody. We have, and myself, Laura. We are here this evening for the dressage instructors webinar number two, and we're going to move on to the horse um, horse business 101 record keeping. And we love our horses, and sometimes we forget about the business aspect of our horse business and we let our record keeping go by the wayside. So we're going to talk about it this evening and um, I'm not sure who'd like to start off with our record keeping. Randy, would you? You know, as I was saying, as we're saying, we brought together the dressage instructor because we are professionals in the horse business. We know what you need to be a success. We know some of the things we're going to share with you are so hard. I admit, you know, I live the fantasy of horses. I can teach, I can train, I can do that all day long. But at one that comes down to record keeping, it's the hardest thing that I have to do. However, you need to understand that what you're doing is a business. That means you have accountability for your records for not only business purposes, but tax purposes. So we're just going to give you some th simple things for you to think about. Try just doing one thing to start with because I'm going to tell you some information that's going to make you want to run out of the room. <laughs> we know what you feel. You just start a little bit at a time and build up to that. And one of the things that you need to be doing every year is making sure that you've got these from liability signed from your students. I mean, if you have a child, both parents have to sign it, but it has to be re-signed every year and kept in your records, depending on your state's limit of statutes. It could be that you have to keep these records from three years or in some states up to seven years. Only you'll know if you ask your attorney how long your statute of limitations are. So you need to keep those. You also need to have emergency consent form. If yes. you've got anybody under the legal age of 18, whatever the legal age is for your state, you need to make sure that their parents have signed the emergency consent forms and that you have them on file in case something happens. Again, has to be redone every year. So those are those are pretty simple, right? But there's more than that. Let, let's talk some more record keeping. For example, you know, you've got all these people coming to your barn or taking lessons. Where are your records on your ring rules? Do you have your ring rules posted? Yeah, it's Wait. got to be posted. They've got to be posted, and you should be handing yeah. out, because this is part of your yearly thing you want to do for your record keeping, you want to make sure that you hand them out to your, and that they've read them. Even if you have to give them two copies and sign one copy that they've read it, they need to understand that you have barn rules and ring rules and what they are. Of course, you have them sign it, date it, the second copy, and keep it in your record. Okay, Randy, I've got a, um, a comment here from Deborah. 
She Hi, says, do you, do you have a standard legal consent form that you could share so we can compare it to our own? Well, every, every liability form is different for the state that you're in. So you can go online and you can find your equine liability statutes for your state, but an attorney will always tell you, and I would have to say this too, you should always check with an equine-related attorney to make sure. Rather than attorney, what about your insurance consent form? Is there, there's, you know, your risk of liability, is that different? I would still okay, talk so to the attorney. Nicole says your insurance will help too. They have requirements to insure trainers. So, you know, there's a little bit of overlap there, I guess. But you, you, uh, you have a resource for the, the forms, right? Yeah, well, you can ask your insurance company if they have one specifically for your state. We have 50 states, yeah. and each one has different exceptions. Don't think the equine liability statutes are going to protect you from everything. Sorry, we're going off into legal issues. So we're talking about forms. That was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do was come up with the forms because you can't find them right. anywhere, basically, yeah. right? So this uh, one of the organizations I'm a part of is the Certified Horsemen's Association, and they have this book. It's called the Equine Professional Manual, and Certified Horsemanship Association, so you know, certifies and trains instructors. Guess what they have? Forms. You should have intake forms. Remember, don't try to do this all at one time. Information on the riders that you're coaching. When a rider comes in, are you evaluating them? Are you keeping yes. a record of the evaluations that you're doing with them? Have you, can you show, like in this one, what I like is it has progression sheets. You can take your students, and every time, it's like a report card. When they learn something, step number one. For example, for a beginning rider, did you teach the rider to be safe around a horse? When they have, give them a check. Or a lot of barns actually will put charts on the barn that have the goals for the riders, and every time they've accomplished it, they get a little star or a check mark, which shows that they're doing a step-by-step -step progression, and it helps you with your record keeping to prove that you're making sure that your riders and your horses are safe. What other record uh, forms would you think would be considered important, Jody? Record keeping, it's a necessary discipline in order to run your business professionally and effectively. And of course, it's no fun. Um, of course, the most there, there are basically four reasons that we would keep records. We would keep it for business purposes, which is like taxes. Uh, we would keep it for insurance purposes, especially if we're documenting any incident that happened. We would keep records for legal purposes, like hold a harmless and uh, those types of forms. And of course, we would we would like the most fun record keeping would be progress reports on our riders and how they've been progressing. And I do have a fun little story about that. I, when I was in California, I used to ride every year with an instructor named Alfred Knopfart, who had been at the Spanish Riding School and had ridden with Podolsky. And he would come once a year, and I would enter the lesson, and he would say, hello, Jody. And he would pull out this little tiny notebook that was like two inches by three inches. And he would look at this little tiny shorthand, and he would say, I see that last year we were most effective by using, in your pirouette work, by using this square. And I see that we got the four tempies, but we didn't have the three tempies. And I see, and he had all this record in this tiny little notebook. His entire, all the four years or five years that I rode with him were there. And um, I just bring that up because it's an, it was an amazing a year ago and two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. So the progress reports are a lot more fun than, let's say, taxes. But you, you do have to organize yourself. You do have to be consistent. You have to realize that you're taking care of your business, and it's a really important piece. And some of those things can be combined. Like I just designed a little tiny tax program for myself that every day or every week I input everything from that day that's pertinent. So my miles, where I drove, and how many miles, you know, any feed store receipts, any deposits, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that just ended up being like a great record because I had my miles, but I had a record of who I taught and where I went. Um, I had my 
um, deposits, which was a record of who I taught and who paid. I had my entertainment. I have my entertainment, so I know where I ate and wh who I went and discussed what with. So that one piece of record keeping has actually served multiple purposes. But I think you just have to start somewhere and just do it. The important thing is to stay consistent and do it. And there are some um, apps, there are, there are some apps that people have that actually help you with the process because you like Jody says you get into the habit. Yeah. Now, Laura, you also do something for your record keeping. What is it that you've been doing over the years? Do we have Laura? Laura. <laughs> she might have taken, with the, we're learning the webinar process, so thank you for your patience as we go through the, the process of getting it to work and making right. everything works. So what Laura does is she actually, I think we've lost her, see if she'll come back in. She has been keeping journals for years, and what she does is she has a journal she takes with her to the barn. She writes down the name of the writer, the lesson process that they're using, what they're working on in the lesson, the date. You know, if there's a horse that has an issue or the horse comes up lame or the horse has any issues, she keeps track of all of that, which reminds me of another record we need to be keeping, and that's incident reports. You know, are you keeping reports on when your riders have had accidents because it's a high-risk sport? Or if your horses have kicked another horse or bit a horse, there's so many records that we need to know more about. But it's all part of the process, and as we were saying, you know, it just we just have to be able to do a little bit at a time so we get more comfortable with it. Jody, it looks like Laura has yeah. kicked off a little bit here, so we'll just continue there. So, you know, our goal with the dressage instructors webinars and the process that we're doing is to help you get to a better place with your business. And we know some of the things that we're sharing with you are going to make you want to run out the back door. <laughs> we know that. But we also know how important you are yeah. to the horse. I mean, you make a difference. You know, the world is a better place because of you. And if all you need to do is to refine what you're doing a little bit, what have you got to lose? How many people can live their dreams like we can? You know, and if all we need to do is focus more on some of the big And that's the important point. I mean, that, that's the important point is that we do have a life that we love, and we're doing what we love. And so it's easy to focus on all the fun stuff and the stuff that, you know, we feel is important, but we do have a business. And this is where um, instructors get in trouble tax-wise and legally because they just haven't taken the care and the time to just even a simple little note. Um, it's the first step. And then, of course, if you have something like an incident happen, you need to write down everything right away as much as you can um, you need to document that That's right. documentation is very very important because when but you're just daily records if you can just have a process of what I did that day That's right. that will that will be an amazing step forward for you to start to gain control of your business and your taxes and your the records that you have to have and those are records that are important you have to keep well, them for Three to seven years, like I said, for example, if something happens, if an incident happens and insurance is involved, you're going to have an attorney come to your door and they're going to say, show me your records for the last seven years. I want to see who's been riding what horses and one lessons. I want to see the evaluations you do on your lesson horses to make sure that they're safe for the riders that you have riding them. You've got to be prepared for that because if it happens, what do you have to prove? that you have been running your operation like a real business, which means keeping the records. I actually got audited like three years ago, tax audited for my horse business. And of course it set me into a panic, but I was so organized because I had been, I had set up this little thing for myself, you know, and basically what it was is just a little program that had all the different categories of where my expenses would be, and I just every day kept a record of it. And so when the, the tax person got here, I just had it all printed out, and I had all my receipts and envelopes, and it wasn't really that hard for me to produce it for them. And they were so impressed. They did not find one thing. I ended up being absolutely fine on my audit, but it really empowered me. It made me feel like this was worth it to have designed something that helped me keep those types of records. It is important. I think Laura's, let's see if she's found her way back again. 
Yes, I'm here. Welcome back, Laura. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm not quite sure what happened there, but I got lost in the intergalactic goo. Oh, well, so, it's a learning process. It's just like riding dressage. We never stop learning. And now that we're going into the adventure of going online with promoting and marketing our horse businesses, this is a process that many of those watching may want to get into as they go further in their business. So there was a couple of questions here that were asked. I think Deborah had a good question on the qu questioning techniques. Now, it, could you touch on how teaching children versus adults is different? Or how to use words and phrases, questions that won't confuse a 7 to 12 year old? So I'm not sure if that's something you want to touch on right now or if you would like to deal with that on the Dressage Instructors webinar page. We can do both, but that's a great question, okay. Deborah, because yeah. we do communicate to younger people different, and they don't have ways. You know, usually the – I would see a beginner is a beginner regardless of whether they're a child or an adult. We still have to break it down to the same system and ask the same questions and take them to the same process. However, when we're talking about a younger rider versus an older rider that has more experience, maybe that's what you're talking about, Deborah. That's a whole different thing. Our whole goal with our beginner, medium riders or whatever is to protect them every step of the way. So we're going to be asking them questions. We're going to be leading them in the right direction, making sure they're safe beyond anything. Right, guys? Yeah. Safety first. Safety first, fun second. Yeah, I was going to say, I taught a lot of children at one time, and, and I really enjoyed it. And one of the things was I made sure, which you probably know, Deborah, but it was, is not to be condescending. I mean, children want to be talked to like adults. I mean, it's not, like you said, maybe not the exact same terminology, but they want to be respected um, and safety first. And, the, of course, the challenging thing with children is keeping their interest and keeping it on the fun, challenging, um, the more they rose to that challenge. And they really appreciated that. They really liked being treated almost as an adult. So that was just a little side. And going back to the, that's a good point. And going back to the record keeping, especially with the lower level riders, you want to make sure you have a written down process that shows you have covered every step with them. You know, one of the things that are big is like if you're teaching a rider to mount, you should be teaching them how to dismount at the same time. Right. You know, so teaching, teaching young people, I think, too, you have to make sure they understand and know what being unsafe is and not in balance is and so you have to show them what that is so that they understand because what they, they don't know they just think everything is safe and, and that's a great point because I think when you teach kids you have to really really make sure they know what the rules are yes. um, it, you know safety rules what those safety rules are but really making sure that they know why that they understand it's not just you being you know, a hard instructor, but that you are, it's for these reasons. And again, I think they really join the program when you've taken the time to explain things and let them know, you know, why these rules are in place, but that you must hold them strictly to those rules. Are there definitely? That was a good question, Deborah. Yep, yep. There was something also about the insurance. So we had a little few things about the insurance, where to find the insurance things. Uh, but other than that, there is uh, no other questions, and I'm sure that if if you do have questions, please go to the Dressage Instructors Facebook page, and you can ask them there. You can ask them here. We're getting and once again. If you're just tuning in, this is the Dressage Instructors webinar number two. We're going to have to move on. So, does everybody heard of the Dressage Instructors Boot Camp in the spring of 2017? Well, we're excited about it, that's for sure. And it's going to be fun. Type, we've type yes or no in the chat if you've heard about it. I, we, we, we are getting on board with this. We'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Great opportunities to network with other dressage instructors from around the world. We've got professional phot photographer coming so that you can get some really nice professional photos done. Uh, top trainers are going to share their favorite teaching techniques. Uh, something about musical freestyles. Maybe you could touch on that, Randy. What's going on with the musical freestyles? We have our musical freestyle lady coming in who's going to help everybody understand 
all the questions they have about creating musical freestyles for their writers. Also, uh, uh, somebody's going to be there to instruct you on saddle fitting, how to fit saddles with their horses, and there's learning cutting edge techniques that you can use to improve your horse business right now, right away, and we're just so excited about it. Uh, Jody, what's your take on this opportunity to be a part of education I just get super excited about. And what I love about the concept of this boot camp, instructor's boot camp, is it's an opportunity to come and educate yourselves, come and share what you do. I don't hear knowledge. her anymore. Yeah. It's an opportunity to create a safe uh, peer network yourself as an instructor. So it excites me. And we're going to have top trainers and instructors that are going to be here who will also be sharing some of their techniques with you. Our goal is to give you step-by-step -step processes that you can take home and use right away that will make a yeah. difference in how you're instructing your riders. It will make a difference in how you're doing your business. And we're going to help you become visible because we're going to show you more ways that you can market and promote your business that will attract the people who are looking for what you have to offer. So yeah. we have designed this with you in mind. It's going to be a big event, but it's also going to be a very intimate event because there's going to be yeah. lots of different people there, and it's going to be specifically designed for instructors. Yes. Yes. It's going to be great. Excellent. It's going to be a lot of fun and really just superb education. Yes, and we'll be allowing some of you who want to come as participating instructors where you'll be practicing the techniques. We'll have other people who will be auditing. And don't forget, Randy and Jody, tell them where it's going to be. Try on North Carolina 2017. It's the Dressage Instructors Boot Camp. Well, now let's talk about our next webinar because we're getting ready. We're going to be doing these webinars right until the boot camp in May, right? Absolutely. Excellent. I'm all so, that. What are we going to cover in our next uh, webinar? I know we had talked about we wanted to go into, oh, ring etiquette, especially in the warm-up ring. Probably teaching techniques for that. Yep. We'll and uh, that's a good coaching, teaching place yes. Um, yes, to be talking about. And what would you yeah. like to go into? Have you thought about what you'd like to do for from the judges box? Well, I mean, there, there are just so many topics. I know. You just have to choose. I mean, so you know, there's... That's why we want everybody to start sharing with us what you'd like to know more about because right. we have so much experience that we could pull out 10,000 techniques in five minutes. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things to go, you know, path, you know, correct aids for lateral work, you know, talking about the lateral work because you're starting to get into that first, second level stuff. You know, there, I mean, there's just we so even, many... Continue on with the straightness. I mean, we we just yeah. kind of brushed on the straightness yeah. option well, we'll as well. what we're going to do, but you can be sure that we're going to come up with something that you'll find that you need to be able to at least think about so that you can make a difference in what you're doing. So uh, the recording will be available when it's available, probably posted on the Dressage Instructors Facebook page. Is that right, Randy? We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and as a wrap-up, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. It was really a whole lot of fun. I really enjoyed myself. And I'd like to thank Randy. Thank you, Randy. And Jody. And Jody. Thank, thank you, Jody. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. And, and Laura, thank you. Uh, Jody, any last words? Just looking forward to the next one. Excellent. And Randy, last words for you. Last words are, be sure to come to the Dressage Instructors Facebook page where we've created the community there. We're looking forward to hearing your questions, your comments. We know it's not easy sticking your neck out and starting to talk to each other, but we're there to help you with the process because by creating a network, we can all make a difference for each other. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Laura, and I'd like to thank Randy Thompson and Jody Lees for coming out and making this a very successful Dressage Instructors webinar. Please go to the Facebook page, Dressage Instructors, and if you're using Twitter, 
Hashtag dressage instructors. Please stay in touch. Love to see you on Facebook. Thanks very much, guys. See you later. Bye, everyone. Bye.